Hi and welcome to this Microbiology Basics video on rolling circle replication in plasmids where I hope to quickly recap on what a plasmid actually is, the different types of replication that can occur within plasmids and then I'll go on to the process of rolling circle replication using an animation which quite frankly took a long time to produce but I think it's worth it because it accurately describes the entire process of rolling circle replication. So hopefully after watching this video any questions you would have had before you clicked on it will have been answered and you'll be more informed going forward. So with that let's crack on and I really hope you enjoy the video. So first of all let's give this video a little bit of context by recapping the basics of what a plasmid actually is. So within a cell, plasmids are observed as small pieces of double-stranded DNA that exist independently of the bacterial chromosome. If we look at the picture on the right, taken from a microbiology and evolving science, we can see chromosomal DNA leaking out of a bacterial cell, with the DNA strands covering up most of the image. And on the right, I've highlighted a single loop of double-stranded DNA. This is our bacterial plasmid that has also been released from the cell, and it's quite obvious that there is this massive size difference between the two. Now, plasmids are classed as extragenomic elements because they do not form part of the bacterial chromosome, but they do form part of the bacterial genome, hence the term extragenomic. Now, essentially, plasmids give the bacteria additional traits which it wouldn't usually have. Now, these additional traits can be both good and bad, as I will go into in a minute. So what are some of the key features we need to know about plasmids? Well firstly, plasmids can be linear or circular, however the majority of plasmids tend to be circular as linear plasmids are susceptible to degradation at their terminal ends by various host and environmental enzymes. However, some linear plasmids have adapted to the point where they have closed loop ends to ward off any form of degradation. Secondly, as I hinted at earlier, they carry non-essential genes. As they are part of the cell's genome but not part of the chromosome, they encode non-essential genes which usually provide some form of enhanced physiology. Now as I said earlier, this can be both good and bad depending on your viewpoint. So on the good side, plasmids containing genes to produce human insulin can be inserted into bacteria allowing them to produce this critical human protein. And on the bad side, some plasmids contain genes that allow bacteria to circumvent the killing effects of antibiotics, allowing them to tolerate and grow in the presence of antibiotics. This contributes to the antimicrobial resistance crisis and is becoming very problematic in a clinical setting. And finally, plasmids are self-replicating, which means the replication process occurs independently of the bacterial chromosome. So the process by which plasmids replicate is not only different to that of the bacterial chromosome, but it's also not linked to it at all. Plasmids can replicate almost as and when they like, not just during the cell division process. However, it's very common for them to undergo the replication process during the cell division process, because much of the machinery required to duplicate plasmids is in abundance during this time period, and also it ensures the daughter cells that are being produced through the cell division process have enough copies of the bacterial plasmid in them. Now when plasmids undergo replication, there are two different methods by which plasmids can achieve this. The first and less common is bidirectional replication. This is where the replication process starts at a single point known as the origin site and replication occurs in two directions simultaneously to the other side of the plasmid. The second method is rolling circle replication, which I guess you could call unidirectional. Again, just as before, replication starts at a single origin site. However, the replication process occurs in a single direction. As this is one of the more common mechanisms of plasmid replication, it is what I'll be covering for the rest of the video. Now, before we move on to the actual process of rolling circle replication, it's very important to remember that whilst there may be some similarities between plasmid replication and chromosome replication, in terms of components and terminology used, they are very distinct processes, so be sure not to get them mixed up. So now that we've gone over a few basics, here is a little animation that breaks down rolling circle replication into its most basic form, which I hope will be easy to understand. So, first things first. A plasmid encoded initiator protein, known as REPA, seeks out the site of origin on the plasmid. This is essentially an area of the plasmid that the protein recognises as where the process of replication should begin. Once the REPA protein has identified the origin site and bound to the double-stranded DNA, it nicks one of the sugar phosphate backbones and attaches to the exposed 5' phosphate group. The exposed 3' hydroxyl group acts as a primer for the host-encoded DNA polymerase 3 enzyme. 
This identifies the free 3' hydroxyl group and associates with it. Using the parental plasmid DNA as a template, seen here in red, it will construct a new complementary daughter strand of DNA displacing the single-stranded DNA associated with the REP-A protein. To aid the entire process, the DNA needs help unwinding, and to do this, REP-A recruits DNA helicase onto the replication fork, which is where the double-stranded DNA becomes two single DNA strands. Throughout the process, the sole function of DNA helicase is to unwind the DNA and make a template available for DNA polymerase to function. Now, multiple things happen at once. Firstly, DNA helicase unwinds the double-stranded plasmid, creating a single-stranded DNA tail. This single-stranded DNA tail peels off the plasmid and is surrounded by single-stranded binding proteins. These are present throughout the host cell and attach to areas of single-stranded DNA in order to stop them from associating with other strands of DNA or forming loop structures with itself. Essentially, it stops the DNA from becoming tangled. As the single-stranded DNA tail is produced, we have the exposure of a template DNA strand, which DNA polymerase uses to produce a single, complementary daughter strand of DNA, seen here in red and orange. So this all continues until we have a fully synthesized daughter strand of DNA. The REP-A protein joins the two ends of the single-stranded DNA and goes on its way. At this point, the DNA polymerase 3 and DNA helicase enzymes have also done their job and dissociate from the double-stranded plasmid. All that is left to do on the first plasmid is to have DNA ligase patch up the sugar phosphate backbone and join the two ends together. For the second plasmid, the shape of the plasmid twists, which I haven't shown here because that is beyond my animating skills, but when it does twist, it shakes off some of the single-stranded binding proteins. This exposes part of the single-stranded parental DNA which host RNA polymerase uses to produce an RNA primer. Once produced, it detaches and the primer is used by DNA polymerase 3 to produce another daughter strand of DNA using the parental strand as a template. Once it gets to the end, the same things happen. The sugar phosphate backbone needs joining together and this is done via DNA ligase again. And so in doing this process, which I've simplified as best I can, we end up with two plasmids each of which contain a parental strand of DNA from the original plasmid, which we can see here with the single coloured strands, and a freshly synthesised daughter strand of DNA, which can be seen by the dual colour strands. Now after watching this once, you probably won't fully understand or appreciate exactly what is going on in the animation, but if you rewind and rewatch the animation a few times, hopefully it will start to make a bit more sense. So to recap, Firstly, we have identification of the site of origin or ORI site by the plasmid encoded protein REP-A. This initiates the replication process by nicking a single strand of DNA on the plasmid. Next, DNA polymerase and DNA helicase associate with the double stranded plasmid and together allow the production of a new daughter strand that is complementary to the template parental strand. The single-stranded DNA that is displaced is covered with single-stranding binding proteins to help protect it. The plasmid is then finalised using DNA ligase, which seals the NIC DNA sugar phosphate backbone on the freshly synthesised DNA strand. Finally, RNA primase creates a primer on the single-stranded DNA, which DNA polymerase 3 uses to produce another complementary strand of DNA, which is then finalised with DNA ligase. The result of this process is two plasmids, each of which contain a single strand of parental DNA from the original plasmid and a newly synthesized daughter strand. These two plasmids then remain in the cell to the point where it divides, and there are some various systems in place to ensure plasmids end up in the right daughter cell during the cell division process, however, I'm not going to cover that in this video. So 
So that's the basics of rolling circle replication in a nutshell. I hope it answered any of the questions that you had when you first clicked on the video. If not, you can ask me questions on Twitter or in the microchat Discord server, links of which will be in the video description below. Alternatively, you can comment on this video with any questions you may have. If there are any video topics you'd like to see in the future within the biological sciences, then again, please do let me know. Be sure to subscribe for videos like this in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.